Hello everyone. Um, good morning to those of you in the UK and good evening to those of us here on the other side of the world. Thank you so much for joining us at this webinar today. Uh, and it's on the topic of place-based development. My name is Fiona McKenzie. I'm an adjunct research fellow at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. And I also work for the Victorian state government here in Melbourne. I work as a principal science writer, that's uh, in terms of social science, and I work with the uh, Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability. So I cross the boundaries, I guess, between government and academia. I've worked as a researcher in state government for more than 20 years, and much of my work has looked at regional economic development and regional demographic change. So today's webinar is more or less the culmination of a two-year project um, that I did with fellow researchers, Andrew Beer, um, Marku Suratu, Jerry Blazek, and Sarah Ayers, so an international team. And we did our uh, study on place-based development as part of the RSA Policy Expo program. Now, the Policy Expo um, really aims to bring together uh, policy and academic research. So what I wanted to do in providing an introduction to today's webinar is talk about um, just a little bit about that connection between academic research and policy. We actually produce two products as part of our project. The first of them is the booklet. So this is the main booklet on place-based development and Andrew Beer will be talking through the findings of that. And in opening, I just want to make mention of a journal article that we produced, which looked more at the method that we used to do this study. And it very much focuses on this idea of academic research and policy coming closer together. So in relation to that, um, it, within academia, there's an increasing emphasis placed on research impact. Those of you who have applied for academic funds will probably have come across this, where you have to indicate what impact your research is going to have on policy or on society more generally. Meanwhile, in the policy world within government, there is an emphasis on evidence-based policy. So policy that's informed by the latest research and thinking. And so at one level, these two ideas of research impact and evidence-based policy seem to be complementary. They seem to fit together quite well. But in reality, the two groups, sometimes referred to as two communities, have quite different ways of working, different time frames, different cultures. And so to try and bring those two together is not always easy. In our research project, we did it through a process, I guess, of the research team acting a bit as knowledge brokers. So it wasn't a case of just getting some academics and getting policymakers and locking them in a room together. What we did as a team was we used the RSA conferences first to make contact with academics. So we held a couple of workshops where we talked through the ideas around place-based development and found out some of the sort of leading thinking in that arena. And then we asked, um, asked the academics to do something that probably they weren't used to doing, which was to come up with a set of 10 questions that we could take to, um, to government policy makers. And so in that process, it was quite important in a way, the academics had to distill some of their ideas into the policy context. We then took those, the findings from that work and this set of questions, we took it to a meeting in Brussels where we met with policymakers uh, from the European Commission. And we presented some of the findings and some of the work of the academics, but then we presented these questions to them. And what followed was a very engaging conversation, one that the policymakers really appreciated. I think we probably left them wanting more, which is a very good sign. But on reflection, and something I bring out in the article, is that within the policy world, often the types of information gathering or research you're doing is very much based on questions, whether that be from a minister or a senior executive, or indeed it may come from the public or come through the media. 
And so the idea of posing questions and getting a discussion going, having this base of information from academia, proved to be a really good way to get the two groups, in a sense, understanding each other. And so I think, um, it, as I say, there's an article on this. If you want to read more, I can easily provide the details of that following on from this webinar. But let me turn now to, I guess, the, the subject matter of the webinar, which is place-based development. And I guess for all of us, we can say that place matters. All of us are in a location at the moment, even though we're meeting virtually. I, for example, I'm in Melbourne, Australia, but I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently located. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, because the Wurundjeri are part of the world's oldest living culture. And indeed, they can claim to have been in this place for tens of thousands of years. Now, you and I probably can't claim tens of thousands of years in one location. However, place is nevertheless still very important for us. It's where we work, where we live, where we play. And the characteristics of the place in which we operate often determines, um, well, in some cases, our life chances. It certainly can um, affect the opportunities we have. And so this brings it back to why this topic of place-based development is of such interest to researchers and policymakers, because where people are born and live and grow up can very much affect their life chances. And both academics and government are very interested in that kind of dynamic. So having given my introduction, just a, a one housekeeping matter, I guess, which is to do with questions, which we're hoping that our seminar today will um, prompt. You'll all be familiar with Zoom, I think, and down the bottom you'll see that there's a Q&A section. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please write your question into that Q&A. And then after Andrew has spoken, I'll be able to um, present some of those questions to him or even to myself if, if you want to ask any questions of me. So introducing Andrew Beer, Andrew is the Executive Dean of UniSA Business, which is based in Adelaide, Australia. He's a Fellow of the Regional Studies Association, the Regional Australia Institute, and the UK's Academy of Social Sciences. So he is a triple fellow. Andrew's worked on regional and housing research for more than 20 years. And so I'll hand over to him to present the findings from our work on place-based development. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much, Fiona. And it's the first time I've been called a triple fellow. <laughs> I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking today from the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. I also want to acknowledge my co-authors in this project as I'm presenting work that we did together. And as Fiona has mentioned, that includes Drew Blaschek, Fiona McKenzie herself, Sarah Ayres, and Marku Sotaratla. It was truly a multidisciplinary team that was involved in this project. If we could move to the first slide, please. So in, today, uh, in today's presentation, I want to take us through some of the core findings of our work. And I really want to bring out some of the key issues I think remain to be discussed and debated more broadly between policymakers and academics as we look to improve place-based policy into the future. So the first thing we'll do in this presentation is I will discuss the definition and understanding of place-based policy because we need to define what we're talking about we also need to develop a sense of how other people, how all of us both have common elements in our understanding of place-based policy, but also have slight differences, which can be quite potent. I wanna talk about the subjective element of place-based policy, and Fiona has provided a very good example of that with her reference, the traditional lands of the people that she, whose land she sits on. I wanna talk about what place-based policy 
can achieve and why it's deployed by governments. I want to talk about the success factors for place-based policy, many of which I'm going to argue are not those that governments usually think about and in many ways are issues that are quite uncomfortable for many governments around the world. They're uncomfortable because they require them to behave in a way that I think increasingly governments find challenging. And finally, I'm going to present our conclusions, which in many ways, I think, provide a ready prescription around place-based policy and how to achieve better outcomes and impacts from its implementation. If we could move to the next slide, please. So here are the definitions on place-based policy that we came to after, as a group, after a considerable amount of time, a considerable amount of thinking, and a considerable amount of debate. And our opinions and our conclusions were really shaped by all the inputs we had, both the published literature, but also the input we had from our academic colleagues at RSA conferences, and also policymakers in Brussels and elsewhere. I think one of the key things we really need to acknowledge is that place-based policy in any meaningful way is not business as usual for governments. It is not simply a targeting of public sector resources to one place and pretending that that will have an impact above and beyond simple expenditures. Importantly, good place-based policy has to acknowledge the context of those places that it is seeking to assist. It is a tailored approach. There cannot be what in popular language in Australia you might call a cookie cutter approach or a one size fits all approach to rolling out programs. Place-based policy to be effective needs to be able to be different from one location to the next it needs to be able to mobilise resources that are available locally, and it needs to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that sit in that place, but not necessarily elsewhere. The other thing about place-based policy is it also seeks the development of all parts of the landscape. Because as we say, it is an ethos of development, and it's an ethos that says every place, no matter how large or no matter how small, can actually be made better. Now that's a really powerful argument. It's a very, very powerful philosophy. It's also a challenge when we come to questions of implementation and we'll come on to that later in this presentation. If we could move on please to the slides. So this infographic represents much of the work we did as a group of researchers and represents a great deal of the input we receive from others. Core elements of place-based policy for the 21st century include a very strong focus on governance, but they also include a very profound understanding of place and places, what their needs are, what their potentials are, etc. There's a very explicit focus on community wellbeing. And there's also an acknowledgement of the role of local leaders in bringing about positive change in these places. Now, this last one is an, is an element that to a certain degree is quite confronting, particularly for policymakers, because policymakers don't necessarily have strategies or ways of thinking about local leadership as enabling the success of central government programs in many instances. It's a challenge, but it's a challenge that can lead to progress and advancing really a core part of government operations in all developed and developing economies. So we, I just reinforce there are four key elements and in many respects, each of these has to be strongly developed if place-based policy in whatever context is to achieve what it seeks to achieve. If we could have the next slide, please. 
I just want to emphasize that there are multiple understandings about place-based policy and there are multiple ways of thinking about place-based policies. So at the RSA annual conference in Santiago de Compostela, we started our focus group discussion by asking the academics in the room, and they were all academics, what do you think of when we say place-based policy? And you see below you a series of dot, at the bottom of the slide, a series of dot points that reflect what people understood as place-based policy. For some people it's issues like co-design, for other issues it's other people it's very specific programs such as smart specialisation, for others it's about networks, for others it's about the process of coming together and achieving consensus and for a th another group it's all about cross-boundary working. And the thing I would like to emphasise today is that all of these points are correct. Place-based policy is a container. It is a container which has room for all of these elements of social policy and economic development. It can, it can and must include local institutions. It must include leadership. It must embrace complexity. And it's the combination and the ways in which policies seek to mobilise all these elements that really leads to success in place-based policy. The other thing I'd like to say before moving from this slide is that if you read the booklet that Fiona very kindly showed us all, one of the things that really comes out is that place-based policy is evident in many, many policy domains. It is not limited to local economic development, though that is really the area that is closest to the hearts of the research team. We found place-based policies that relate to managing the environmental impacts of climate change. We found place-based policies about health, about social, so, science, uh, social service provision, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many policy domains acknowledge the key role place in determining human wellbeing and seek to use place-based approaches to achieve better outcomes. If we could move on, please. Finally, I just wanted to draw out, and this is um, a dualism, and I must say I have somewhat, or we have somewhat, spread the polarity here. Um, these are two ideal types. Place-based policies can, of course, be high distinguished from what, what are often thought of as spatially blind policies. They have a much more limited geographic focus and they have an acknowledgement of what many would argue would be the day-to-day -day realities of contemporary economies. Issues around labour embeddedness. Labour is not entirely fluid. It does not necessarily move willingly, willingly from one place to the next. It acknowledges the need to assist particular places and it sees inequality between places as a bad thing for national economic growth. Where spatially blind policies is very, are, are very different. They welcome and embrace large cities. They accept and encourage labour mobility and they see unfettered markets as being the solution to economic ills, not necessarily strategic action by governments. Of course, most nations around the world have a mix of these policies. We rarely find any programmatic area that opts for one approach over the other. But it's important to acknowledge and recognise this tension in so many policy settings, where many of the objectives of governments are achieved through a mix of these two policies. And sometimes, of course, they can work in opposition to each other. If we could move on, please, to the next slide. One of the things that really came out in the review of the literature, but I think was also present in the discussions with policymakers and particularly academics, is the subjective element to place-based policy. Place-based policy fundamentally accepts 
the places are created because they're the places where people live their lives. And they naturally have an emotional attachment to places because these are the places where they live, their children live, their parents live, and often their great parent, grandparents live and, their, and those before them. The Aboriginal peoples of Australia are a great example of placed attachment. The Aboriginal peoples in Australia, country is everything. And that means that place-based policies need to acknowledge these drivers or do acknowledge these drivers, do acknowledge this attachment and look at ways to making that attachment an asset for the further development of that place. If people are attached to a place, they will do more, they will achieve more, they will have higher aspirations for that place and they might act in ways that may not be in their own best interest, but in the long term serve themselves, their families and their communities. So the subjective element of place and the subjective element of place-based policy is very important. And on reflection, some of the most interesting discussions we have with policymakers in Brussels are about their acknowledgement once this issue was raised about just how they too understand people are committed to places, how, under how they understand place is important because this is where people are and this is what they seek to achieve. If we could move on, please. So I just want to touch relatively briefly on the question about the benefits of place-based policy. Why do governments, why do programs seek to use place-based policy? I think there's a number of answers to that and we will go through some of them in this presentation over the next few minutes. But I think one of the most evident, particularly in the regional studies, regional science field, is really around the role of place-based policy as a driver of innovation. I love this quote from Paul Krugman, productivity growth isn't everything, but in the long term, it's almost everything. And there has been a long-standing acknowledgement as everyone around this Zoom meeting would know that some places seem to be more innovative than others. Uh, there was a time in the 1990s where every part of the world thought that they could become the next Silicon Valley or even surpass Silicon Valley. There is something in some of these places that we don't often know what precisely it is that leads to higher levels of innovation, productivity growth, and employment growth. And place-based policies have effectively been recruited as an important part of economic development strategy. They've become a mainstream component of business and how governments think about the growth of their economies. Uh, for most of my working life, I have been in departments of geography in Australian universities. About five years ago, I moved into a business school for the first time. And the first thing that struck me is that it was full of geographers because everyone was talking about how they established clusters and everyone was talking about in, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. So place-based policy, as we all know around this Zoom meeting, is a key way of mobilising innovation and entrepreneurship to deliver growth and deliver that, everything that brings for society and for individuals. If we could move on, please. I think another thing that is very uh, evident in the literature is really that place-based policies are key to mobilising the capacities of higher education institutions. Now, I, I sometimes think that university researchers overstate the case in terms of the impact universities have on their local region. But there can be no denying that universities become key assets, key anchor tenants, if you like, in the economic wellbeing of their region. And place-based policies are needed to bring those advantages out. Whether it's the simple demand that 
universities generate through their students, through their expenditures and their investment decisions, whether it's their sort being a source of highly skilled employees or whether it's innovation and invention. Without place-based policies, many of these advantages will disappear. Many of these advantages will leave the region. And I think governments have come to appreciate this and have come to recognise that it's important to develop a suite of programs, a suite of measures, a suite of place-based policies to make sure that many of the advantages, many of the potentials that are arising always in universities through research and other activity actually have an impact locally. So that's an important part of place-based policy. Higher education as an asset, particularly in the 21st century, where innovation and the drive to long-term productivity growth is so important. If we could move on, please. Um, this is perhaps a controversial point. Often, governments turn to place-based policy simply because they're better policy. Often governments look to place-based policy when they realise the strategies and policies that they have used in the past are no longer achieving what they want. And this can be seen most clearly in places with entrenched disadvantage where national or state-based programs of income support for those who are unemployed or programs that build infrastructure no longer have an impact. But I think we also need to acknowledge that place-based policies sometimes being the policy response of last resort often are at risk because they are taking on very difficult programs of work, they are taking on challenging issues, and there's, there can be a perception that they're ineffective. Now, previous policy settings might have been ineffective for the last 30 years, but if they can't deliver success in three, they may be critiqued heavily. So place-based policies a better policy, but that reliance on them to fix problems that might otherwise just continue carries with it a risk. Um, in my own work, I'm always aware that place-based policies are commonly deployed amongst other measures often by governments seeking to overcome significant shocks. And I think it's, that's one of the key areas where they come to prominence. The shocks associated with the closure of the car industry in Australia, for example, or the German coal industry. And increasingly the shocks many economies will feel as we move away from the use of fossil carbon to alternative energy sources are shocks that will need to be addressed through place-based policies. If we could move on, please. Um, I'm almost embarrassed, and I say almost embarrassed to mention this, but when you look at place-based policies, fundamentally at their heart, they have a focus on improving well-being. They have a focus on improving the well-being of individuals, as Fiona mentioned in her introduction, by addressing the needs of cities and regions and small communities, small townships, because they recognise that often it's these shared opportunities, shared resources that really determines the quality of life individuals and households experience. And that can be reflected in or determined by access to employment, wage levels, uh, access to healthcare services, quality of life, quality of the environment, et cetera. And place-based policies really have that fundamental focus on wellbeing. And that's a really good example. And that speaks to the diversity of place-based policies I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation. Place-based policies with their focus on wellbeing are as important for improving environmental, income, uh, environmental outcomes locally as they are for improving health outcomes locally or employment outcomes locally. 
They also acknowledge, of course, that a place-based approach to improving well-being can take many dimensions and can have many and profound impacts on those communities. So if we look at a place-based policy that looks to increase female participation in the labour force in low-income regions, we can find at least four significant outcomes that can come from that. Raising household incomes, improving educational outcomes, attracting additional enterprises seeking to make use of that pool of labour and adding vibrancy to local retailers. And that it doesn't even mention perhaps a greater level of empowerment of women in their own control of their own lives. So place-based policies have multiple impacts and in many ways it's their focus on wellbeing and improving wellbeing that is so critical. Could we move on please? Um, as part of that commitment to improving wellbeing, place-based policies acknowledge disadvantage. And they acknowledge that disadvantage cannot be solved by individual level assistance alone. Providing someone with income support or providing someone with advice on how to find a new job doesn't necessarily create employment outcomes or raise their quality of life, particularly if they live in a city with 18% unemployment and perhaps 75% youth unemployment. And there are parts of Australia today that do have 75% youth unemployment. Place-based policies that can challenge that disadvantage also create better outcomes and strip away that disadvantage because for, in the instance I gave of youth unemployment, targeting new employment in those areas or job growth in those areas raises their quality of life in the long term. These problem, these place-based policies, of course, are much more complex when compared with programs focused on individual workers or individual industries. It's often more difficult to understand what the impacts are, and they have many more elements. And partly that's because they seek to leverage the existing capacity and investment in those communities to bring about positive change. And that involves bringing forward a wide range of stakeholders to make a contribution. And that, of course, then results in a degree of risk. But of course, it's a risk that potentially has far greater rewards. And I would point you to some of the case studies towards the latter part of the book, particularly the, che the Chechia example around innovation in a particular part of that nation. So there's a higher degree of risk. There's also the potential for much greater uplift relative to the investment. We also need to acknowledge that place-based policies often have outcomes that are either difficult to assess or only emerge in the long term. And I'll speak about that in a little while, but it is important because disadvantage is often intergenerational. Disadvantage is often entrenched in particular places for a very long time. And we're often misplaced or misguided if we think disadvantage doesn't require a long-term effort to bring about positive outcomes. If we could move on, please. So let's now turn to the question of success, because for many policymakers, that's the most important question. Firstly, success in place-based policy calls for competent local governance. And that is a key criteria. These policies and programs need to be administered well. They need to be applied in settings where the community trusts government and they need to be open and transparent in their decision-making processes. Critically, civic participation is a necessary feature of successful place-based initiatives. Because what that means is local individuals and businesses gain access to decision making. And that makes them a key stakeholder in the whole process. It means that you don't necessarily have someone who in Australia we call a bureaucrat making a decision and rolling out a program 
it means that you have key stakeholders lo locally advocating for that program of work and that process of change. And often those are very influential factors in shaping attitudes to and encouraging people to take advantage of these programs. So this is an important part. Civic participation is critical. If we could move on, please. One of the things that was more controversial and I think challenged our colleagues in Brussels when we just presented this um, work there was the whole idea of leadership. When we talk to academics, the academics in Santiago de Compostela and the later workshop we ran in London, leadership was prominent. Academics acknowledged that local leaders needed to be involved in effective place-based policy. There was no question about it. For many of them, it was the beginning and often the end, the alpha and the omega of place-based policy. And it taps into the emotions that I talked about before. It taps into the social networks. It taps into the sense of interconnection. It taps into the leveraging of resources, et cetera, et cetera. And the, document, the papers we produce talk about this in some depth. But for policymakers, this was a revelation. They'd never thought about using local leaders. They'd never thought about approaching communities in ways that weren't part of official, often quite central governments. And I think that's one of the challenges we face as the Regional Studies Association and as a group of researchers. We need to face the challenge of getting policymakers to think more broadly and think somewhat differently about place-based policy. If we could move on, please. Um, this simply gives more detail on what I said before, but I think ideally place-based policy is an inclusive and bottom-up process where everyone has an opportunity to either make an input or know someone who has made an input. We also need to acknowledge that central governments often fail when it comes to place-based policy because they have to balance out com competing interests. Not too far from where I sit today, there's a region that has three cities, all of about 12,000 uh, people. And they're only about 45 minutes from each other by motor vehicle. So by Australian standards, they're very, very close. Vested interest means that a policy that seeks to advance one of those three cities has to advance all three or it can't be rolled out. So they're the pressures central governments inevitably face. But one of the things about place-based policy is that when it's properly implemented, place-based policy harnesses local officials and community buy-in. So there are strong vested interests to maintain the momentum of success over time. If we could move on, please. And this infographic provides uh, insights into some of the ways in which leaders can actually make a contribution with respect to place-based policy. Long-term perspective, social networks, place-specific knowledge, which should not be ever under-emphasized, legitimacy and symbolic capital. One of the things that we often find in Australia is that when you talk to, to smaller communities in particular, they do not see any tier of government as being legitimate in terms of their interests. And I think some of the pushback that Andre Rodriguez posed, um, referred to as the places that don't matter, really talks to this question about the legitimacy of government action and the challenges that that faces. Those challenges can be, under, can be dealt with effectively by harnessing local leadership. If we could move on, please. One of the things that emerged from our analysis of policies is that often policies are implemented and then they just simply fail. They, they don't get, they're implemented with an announcement by governments. There's an, an initial rush of enthusiasm and great expectations. Then all of a sudden, no one's talking about them anymore. 
there's a sense that they haven't achieved what they sought to achieve. And we think of this as the, the tragedy of faltering expectations, as shown in this infographic. So you get to the point of high hopes, then all of a sudden, the black cloud of inadequate governance comes into play. So program design didn't think about governance issues sufficiently. There was a gap, a hollowing out, if you like, in terms of action, and then disappointment set in. So we go back to acknowledging the challenge and three years later, four years later, five years later, we roll out a new place-based policy or other initiative. If we could move on, please. What we found in the literature and which we talk about in the publications associated with this project is that to a very large degree, we can overcome this challenge by more careful program design, but also establishing measurement and benchmarks which are public, published, which are updated on a regular basis and which are informed by local leadership and local communities. So while faltering expectations might have been the death of many place-based initiatives, they don't have to be the death of everyone. Good design, good measurement, good evaluation provides a ready solution to these challenges. As I say at the bottom there, measure, benchmark and evaluate. If we could move on, please. Um, measurement and benchmarks, they need to be both qualitative and quantitative, and they need to have a focus on short-term results, long-term results, and developmental impacts. And that's about thinking about not just whether we're achieving our goals, but also how can we evolve the set of relationships that is the place-based policy as enacted in this place. So it's about thinking beyond the simple metrics while also paying attention to the simple metrics. The next slide, please. So to conclude, I give you really the distillation of many hours of work by all members of the research team. We think these 10 points really capture what governments need to be doing, what policymakers need to be doing, and what researchers need to be talking about and focusing on when we look to develop better place-based policies and programs. I don't think any one of these is innovative, but I do think it's path-breaking to, and to be honest, a little bit conceited, to think that by packaging them together, we can provide a starting point for much better place-based policies into the 21st century. I leave them to you to read at your leisure, but there's just one more slide and I'd have that now, Alex, please. Um, my current senior leadership includes a, a woman who's our Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research and Enterprise, and she argues that when you talk to government, you should have no more than five things that you talk about. So we have four key recommendations and I leave them with you. And they are in their own way, both simple and powerful because they tell governments some very simple messages. You need place-based policy, especially blind policies, don't do what you need to do. Secondly, that governments need to span boundaries break down silos or whatever buzz phrase you want to use and link up programs to achieve better outcomes. And our key determinants for success are a good way to start. Thirdly, governments need to recognise that how they implement place-based policy is as important, if not more important, than what is implemented. So the implementation is the key and I've already spoken just a few minutes ago about some of these implementation issues. This is a very uncomfortable one for governments. Governments like to announce policies, they like to announce new initiatives, but implementation can be something that is more mundane. But place-based policy and achieving significant improvements in the wellbeing and 
people living in these places that are disadvantaged depends on it. And finally, community, local leadership, they're an integral part of what government should be looking to integrate and make central to their policies into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was, that was great and certainly gives us a lot to think about. Um, there are some questions that have been uh, put into the Q&A uh, section, but if people have additional questions, please feel free to pop them in. Um, there's a couple here from Jane, um, and I'll start with the first part, which is, um, we have moved in Europe from a strong political commitment to spatially blind policies to an equally strong commitment to place-based policy. And to what extent do you think that these approaches are simply a fashion or a fad? And how can policymakers effectively combine the emerging approaches? Or do you think that place-based policy is in fact that blended approach? Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Jane, and thanks for reading it out, Fiona. It's very good of you. Um, look, I think I touched upon this in one of my early slides in this presentation. My view is that at any point in time, in any um, in any sphere of government, whatever the spatial scale, whatever its mandate or the, whatever its form, there will always be a mix of spatially blind and place-based policies. And I think in some ways that's a very positive thing. I think it's a positive thing because there are some things that place-based policy is very good at, and I've touched on some of those, particularly around the areas of addressing disadvantage, dealing with long-term un term unemployment, dealing with the very place specific impacts of things such as climate change, dealing with healthcare shortages that find expression spatially. But there are other things that they do much less well and other things that you would always want to be spatially blind. You want a degree of equality. For example, um, in Australia, we all unemployed persons, regardless of which state or territory they live in, have access to the same level of social security support. And I see that as a very positive thing because it means that poorer people living in poorer places aren't disadvantaged. I think Europe's commitment or recommitment to place-based policy is interesting because of course, the Barker report from 2009 had an avowed focus on place-based policy, but the evidence is it was not implemented with great vigour, unfortunately. I think place-based policies are coming back in the European Union because of a couple of things. One of which is that it's a rebalancing because there was too great a focus on uh, industry specific or other universal policies. But also I think because there's been an awareness that the relationship between the European Union and the member nation states and their governments and the communities has become fractured. We've seen that in the rise of populism. Because in many ways, populism that we find expression at the national scale has its roots in individual communities who are being badly affected by all of those ills that we've been talking about today. So the short answer is I think there's always a balancing. I think uh, what, we, what you're witnessing in the European Union is simply a readjustment having gone too far in one direction and having seen the consequences. And fundamentally, I think it goes back to that question of legitimacy I raised before. Governments do need to be seen to be caring for their citizens if, it's, if they want to be seen as legitimate representatives of them, regardless of the political system at hand. So I think we can expect over time to see the pendulum shift in either direction. And I think one of the key things that we need to be doing, particularly in the research community, is documenting success stories, documenting what works. A little bit like my list of 10 that I presented before. We need to document what works because then there becomes a public narrative around success. 
because there has been, in many instances, a public narrative around failure, particularly within some political movements. So I think one of the challenges is to actually start a, a library, a, an e-library of successful place-based policies, which can be made available to policymakers. Because at the moment, that doesn't exist. So if a place-based policy wants to be rolled out, yes, there, can be, there are high-level policy documents. But give me an example. They're very hard to find. Well, there's a, a good challenge for our audience, something to think about, um, and perhaps for the RSA more broadly. That's, that's great. Uh, moving to another question from Mateus, uh, and um, who's been reading your work, Andrew, because um, they state in Beer and Clower 2014, one of your conclusions is that mobilising place-based leadership is much harder in the context of centralised governance systems. So do you think that place-based policy can be effective under those conditions? Um, or do you actually need much, do you need changes in governance structures in order to make it effective? Yeah, that's a really good question, Matthias. Um, look, I think I would still, I would agree that governments and governmental systems that are more willing to share power with local communities are both more conducive to the rise of place-based leadership and also more able and more attuned to the implementation of successful place-based policies. Places that are more willing to share power are, if you like, pre-primed for success with place-based policy. That said, there are many centralist governments, many, many government systems where central governments are all powerful and reluctant to share power. You can also see A, place-based leadership rise up and B, you can see successful place-based policies emerge. And in particular, I think about place-based leaders that emerge not by working with governments, but working in opposition to governments. Places that think you have failed us, central governments. You have failed to meet our needs. We're going to work together and we're going to find solutions and you will just witness the success. Now, in Australia, where I live, of course, that becomes a very powerful, very challenging narratives for governments and they usually try and buy into that success. So in those instances, you can see that while the pathway to local leadership and the pathway to successful place-based policy is more difficult, tactics on the ground, strategies implemented over the long term can be incredibly successful. And there are, in Australia, there are a number of regions that have used that sort of leadership to be very successful in their dealings with central governments. So very different roadmaps there. Um, another part um, that Matthias had in his question, slightly a different aspect, um, was about the thoughts about whether there's a difference between place-based policy as a buzz phrase versus truly innovative policy making. Do you have any comments about, about it simply being used as a buzz phrase rather than being something that for real change? Look, I think it's a really good point. Um, policy cycles go in, you know, policies go in and out of fashion. Governments often churn through policies as one approach is tried, then it fails, different issues emerge. Existing policy settings get thrown in the garbage can. New ones roll out. Five years later, we pull out what we threw out five years ago and roll them out again. Um, this is my point around implementation. I think implementation is key for any policy, any government, any public sector policy or program. But it's particularly key when it comes to place-based policies because there are so many moving parts. There are so many local actors involved. There are so many stakeholders. There are potentially many tiers of government involved. So 
I think part of the work of the Expo and part of the contribution the Regional Studies Association has made in commissioning this work is encouraging us to break that cycle of policy being in fashion and being out of fashion. Because what it says is, here's an opportunity to have a debate. Here's an about place-based policy and what it contributes. Here's also an opportunity to begin to develop other resources, such as the e-library I talked of successful policies I talked about before, that governments can call upon when they have questions about how do I do this? How do I make it better? And as you pointed out in your introduction, Fiona, a lot of research and a lot of government action comes out of government questions. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a cycle of policy fashion and not, but I think there's a chance to break that endless repetition, to get off the juggernaut and to actually embed place-based policy as a long-term positive feature of the suite of policies and platforms government use as they look to build their economies and improve the well-being of their populations. Thank you, that's great. I suppose to throw another challenge at you, and this is um, another question from Jane, who uh, in a very topical question asks whether place-based policies are enough to help regions who are dealing with external shocks. And in particular, um, she raises COVID impacts on lagging regions. So can place-based policies help um, regions in that situation? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I think the short answer is yes. Yeah. Um, I did some other work last year with some colleagues on housing markets. And we're just looking at a very simple indicator of um, uh, well-being, and that was uh, were you evicted or did you feel at risk of being evicted? And one of the things that came out, of course, is that many private tenants in particular felt that risk of being evicted. But the impact was greatest in those labour markets that were most vulnerable to COVID-19. Mm. So an intelligent solution, uh, and of course, the severity of COVID-19 in each place, in each region, also had an impact. But if you were thinking about trying to improve the wellbeing of private tenants, you wouldn't have a one-size-fits-all approach across Australia. You'd actually target your assistance to those labour markets that either had a very severe impact from COVID-19 in terms of the number of cases, or, uh, sorry, and you'd also target those places where the industries were largely high touch, had to close down, and therefore the impact on them was great. Great. Well, we're nearing uh, the end of our time, but I do want to squeeze in a question from Sharif. This is a, an Australian-oriented uh, question. Can we say that the space industry in South Australia is an outcome of place-based policy? I don't know much about how South Australia got its space industry. Um, do you know anything about that, Andrew? Um, yes, I do know something about that, of course, because the Collaborative Research Centre for Space here in Australia is based in, um, based in South Australia and the University of South Australia is the lead partner university and research provider on that. Look, I think that um, the space industry in South Australia is a very good example of both place-based development initiatives and also the complexity of contemporary politics. Because at one level, a political deal was done between political leaders at the national level and the state level. And it was a political deal made possible by the fact that both came from the same party. And the two had been working positively and collaboratively, and there was an element of payback or quid pro quo. So that, that's a real, the real politic of what happened in terms yeah. of placing the National Space Agency here in Adelaide. But the other level, there is a specific place-based policy because that same political leader 
who made the deal here in South Australia, his primary economic development program is the development of a new urban regeneration, urban renewal precinct right next to the CBD, a very large project, very technology focused. So he's, he's saying economic growth in this place of one point of almost, well, just over 2 million people will be driven by this one new innovation centre. And that's a place based policy. Yeah. So political clout meets place-based policy equals success. Excellent. Well, that's a nice way to finish, I guess, with those different levels of, of the story coming together. So thank you very much for that, Andrew. And um, my thanks to the RSA, to Lisa and Alex for helping um, produce this uh, webinar. I've had a, a found it a very interesting time and um, I'd like to thank you all again and farewell from Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much.